Back in 2017, one of my mentors and collaborators, Joseph Rogers, was giving the presidential address for the APA Division 5, which is the quantitative statistics division. And in that address, he showed the syllabus of his first graduate level stats class. And he reported that he also looked at 20 different introductory stats textbooks. And with only very minor deviations, the order and topics covered in his graduate level stats class were basically the same as the 20 different books covering intro stats classes. By the way, Joe went to graduate school in the 70s. Doesn't that even concern you a little bit that in the last 50 years, the table of contents hasn't changed at all? All? In fact, the standard stats curriculum hasn't changed since the 1950s. And yet, since the 1950s, lots and lots of different statistical methods have been developed. Not only have there been new methods, but we think about things differently than we used to. So shouldn't the curriculum have changed even a little? But it hasn't, so why has it persisted? Because it's working! False! The replication crisis is evidence that it isn't at all. I think it has persisted because most people who teach stats aren't statisticians. So when they teach stats, they teach what they were taught because they don't know any better. I also think it's persisted because statisticians feel pressured to teach the old way. Trust me. A few years back, I was invited to give an address to a graduate quantitative psychology program. And in my presentation, I talked about the problem of p-values and proposed a new way of teaching statistics. Afterwards, one of the quantitative psychologists came and talked to me. And she said to me, Don't you dare persist in teaching this new way of doing statistics. Don't you know that our students have to publish? We all know the old way of doing things is wrong and misleading, but our students need to publish. You are doing a disservice to these students. Students. The moment they stop using p-values and start using generalized linear models and visualizations, their academic careers are over! Repent of your wicked ways, son! Wow! You wanna know what my response was? In my head, I'm not a very confrontational person. I thought, no. This is a disservice to continue teaching them the old way because things are changing. If I don't prepare them for the future, they're gonna have no idea what to do. Because things are changing, people! Why else has the curriculum persisted? Inertia. The current curriculum sells, so why change it? Let me tell you why it needs to change. We're in the midst of a replication crisis. If anything else, the replication crisis has told us that something is wrong with the way we do statistics. The standard curriculum doesn't tell people the difference between confirmatory and exploratory research. Or at least only glosses over that issue. At best. And at worst, it makes an enemy out of exploratory data analysis. See my paper linked in the description about exonerating EDA. And conflating exploratory and confirmatory analysis is exactly what caused the replication crisis in the first place. Why else does it need to change? Because there is hard scientific evidence showing that it does not work. Even the brightest and most intelligent of students still do not understand basic statistical concepts like the meaning of a p-value or a confidence interval. Most researchers don't understand them. A lot of textbook authors don't even understand them. And I'm ashamed to admit, up until several years into my PhD, I didn't understand them. So if the best and brightest students, if the best researchers, if statisticians themselves don't understand them, why are we teaching them? But there's even more evidence that shows that the standard curriculum doesn't work. One of my mentors in graduate school, a guy by the name of Robert Terry, once did a study. And what he did was he showed students a list of 20 statistical concepts, like mean and variance and standard deviation and t-test and ANOVA. And what he did was he presented two words at a time, maybe mean and standard deviation. And he asked students to rate on a scale of 1 to 10 or something how similar those two concepts were. And he did that for every single pair of words, which is 20 times 19 divided by two different items. 20 times 19. 380, 380 divided by two. Haha, <laughs> sorry, had to compute it. 190! So he showed them 190 items, giving them a chance to compare each and every statistical concept. Then from those items, he was able to develop networks or mind maps that shows how students think about statistical concepts. And he gave the same information to statistical experts. And what he found was that students tend to perceive statistics in discrete chunks. Here's ANOVA, here's t-test, here's mean, Here's variance. Whereas experts see everything as interconnected. An ANOVA is just a way of looking at different means. Standard deviation is a function of the mean. A t-test is a different way of representing a regression. So the way students are taught statistics is fundamentally different from the way that experts think of statistics. Doesn't that suggest that there's a problem? So why aren't we teaching students to think like experts? And finally, the last reason it needs to change is there is evidence that statistical training actually makes people worse at making important decisions. One paper showed that people trained in statistics tend to see the world in black and white, but without the standard 
standard statistical training, people view things with much more uncertainty, which is how they should view it. So yeah, the curriculum needs to change. It is a horrible abomination to the field of science. With my statistics methodology, I am proposing radical changes. And by the way, I never thought they were radical. I thought it was obvious. Until I started talking to other people and they said, you're crazy. Well, I'm owning it. I'm crazy, apparently. So what are the characteristics of my approach? Number one is visualizations. And this is actually something people don't think I'm crazy about. People can buy into that. Why visualizations? Because we're good at it. We evolved to visually detect patterns really simply, really quickly, really easily. There's research out there showing that people who have never received a lick of training in statistics can make distributional inferences based on a graphic alone. And yet we spend months and months talking about distributions, T distributions, F distributions, normal distributions, trying to get people to understand distributions. Why don't we we just show them a picture, then they can do it. My method also talks about p-values and confidence intervals as kind of this antiquated thing that people used to do. And this opinion is a little harder for some to swallow. Instead, I teach people to build statistical models and to use those models to predict things, to estimate things, to explain things. And I teach model comparisons. That is a little harder pill for people to swallow. They just love their p-values, don't they? But by far the toughest pill for people to swallow is that I teach the general linear model from the very beginning. What do I mean? Let's look at the standard decision tree that we teach to students. That is a lot of information to memorize, and it's entirely unnecessary. And one of my graduate students said that when you teach that decision tree way of doing things, it's easy to think that one of those branches doesn't really matter. He even said to me that as an undergraduate, he said, well, I don't remember what an ANOVA is for. It's probably one of those ones that's not very important. Uh, no. Psychologists love their ANOVAs. Cut, cut, cut! Sorry, ran out of video. Had to start over the next day. So that's the decision tree format. What do I do? My students, all they have to memorize is what is the predictor and what is the outcome. And all they have to do is figure out which is which. Oh, it's so hard to remember that. Isn't that easy? So when I tell people this is my approach, I've received a lot of pushback. And by the way, I haven't received pushback from statisticians. It's all been psychologists. Why is that? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure because they know that it's all the GLM and they can recognize that. But I think the reason they're resistant is because that's all they've ever known. Their minds have been trained to think in terms of t-test, ANOVA, regression, etc. And in the back of their head, they know it's all the same thing, but at the forefront of their minds, they like to think of them in discrete chunks. And so when I propose this general linear model approach, it's too foreign to them. But my students who have not been trained under that separation mentality for years and years and years, they find it so much easier to do the GLM approach. So let me tell you why the GLM approach is better. Normally, it's not until you enter graduate school that you learn that they're all the same thing. And then suddenly they have this radical shift that they have to make. So they've been thinking for years, oh, it's all very different. Now all of a sudden they're all the same. That requires a readjustment of the way that they think, which is really hard to do. When you begin with a general linear model, there is no radical adjustment that you have to make. It's all the GLM from the beginning. And for some reason, some people call them different names, but it's the same thing. Another reason why the GLM approach is better is because it's way easier to conceptualize. There's less to memorize, and then nearly every statistical procedure is just an extension of the GLM. Another reason the GLM is easier is because the advanced statistical methods are just extensions of the GLM. For example, structure equation modeling, hierarchical linear modeling, generalized estimating equations, generalized linear models. All these are just extensions of the general linear model. And for all these advanced procedures, we conceptualize them as a model. And so if we teach students from the beginning that there's this bunch of tests, and then suddenly when they get to graduate school, they have to shift their thinking into now modeling. Again, it's a hard mental transition to make, but if you teach them that we're all just model building from the beginning, and oh, by the way, we can do tests on these models too, then when they get to HLM or SEM or GLMs, it's all the same thing. And that transition is super easy to make. And finally, I think the biggest weakness of the old approach, the decision tree approach, the ANOVA, the t-test, the regression approach, is these can really only be used for hypothesis testing. It's called a t-test for a reason. You are testing a hypothesis. Whereas linear models can accomplish more than just testing. Once you build a model, you can test hypotheses, you can predict, you can explain, you can describe, you can estimate. You can't do all that with a t-test. So general linear models are infinitely more flexible, infinitely more expandable, and they don't require this awkward shift in thinking once you get to graduate school. So by golly, people, why don't we teach the GLM from the beginning? And so what are the results of using the GLM? Well, I tell you, my students get it. I've had several students say they finally understood statistics. Why did people have to go and make it so hard in the first place? And in addition, because I'm not trying to train them about thinking about all these sorts of differences, they learn it faster. So they actually have more time to do data analysis. 
Back when I taught the old method, they never had time to actually do data analysis because I was so busy trying to teach the different distinctions. But now they do. Most of the class time is spent doing the general linear model in software, as it should be. And now, my friends, let me handle some objections that you might have. First and foremost, my students won't be able to communicate with the wider scientific audience. And that's understandable. If everybody in the literature is talking about t-tests, regressions, and ANOVAs, and my students are talking about GLMs, that could be a problem. Except I teach them the names as I go. So I tell them, when we have a GLM with a numeric predictor, we used to call that a regression. Or if we have a categorical predictor with only two levels, we used to call that a t-test. And if there's three groups, we call it an ANOVA. And if there's a grouping variable and a covariate, we called it an ANCOVA. If there's multiple numeric variables, we call it a multiple regression. Multiple categorical variables, it's a factorial ANOVA. But it's all the general linear model. And so yes, by the end of the semester, all my students know the name for a t-test, ANOVA regression, when you're supposed to use it, but they all conceptualize it as a general linear model and it makes it way better for them. A second objection that people have is software issues. I had one of my colleagues say, yeah, that sounds great, but where do I click? And it's not easy if you're using SPSS because they got menus for ANOVA and t-test and regression. By the way, in SPSS, there is a GLM option. You could run all your analyses in there, but this is exactly why I developed a linear modeling module. So if you download JASP and see the linear modeling module, you will see that everything is expressed as a GLM. And so you don't have to figure out, do I push the t-test button or the ANOVA button or the regression button? You just click one button, specify your predictor, specify your outcome, and you're good. Isn't that so much easier from a software and a human factors perspective? And then there's a third objection. Certain topics that we routinely cover in the existing curriculum don't fit as nicely into the GLM. For example, a chi-square test. A chi-square test does not fit into the GLM. So what do I do? Well, we can teach that as a generalized linear model. But in reality, what I do with my students is we don't cover chi-square until their second stats class where we start talking about generalized linear models like logistic regression and Poisson regression. Another topic that I don't cover is multiple comparisons. That is very often heavily covered in your introductory stats classes. So you have an ANOVA and then you follow that up with post hoc tests of group one versus group two, group one versus group three, group two versus group three, and every possible combination, and then you adjust for multiple comparisons, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you're right, I don't cover that. Why? Because I don't care about p-values, remember? I am not at all concerned about whether this particular difference is statistically significant because I've got a graphic that shows me that that is a whopping difference. And who really cares about what the p-value is anyway? And so you may be asking yourself, awesome, this sounds great. Where do I find this curriculum? Excellent question. Right now, you can find this curriculum on the YouTube playlist linked below. I've got a list for undergraduate students as well as graduate students. The major difference is that the graduate students look at assumption violations and they do their calculations in R instead of JASP. And if you give me six months to a year, I'm going to have a textbook written that covers this exact curriculum. So I hope you join me, subscribe, like all that jazz, so that you can keep notified of developments on the general linear model approach to teaching statistics. So with that, peace out. Is it time for lunch?